Welcome to this week's weekly webinar series. My name is Molly Keck and I am an Integrated Pest Management Program Specialist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. I'm also a board certified entomologist. In this weekly webinar, we're going to be covering various landscape and ornamental pests. So I think it's important to understand the difference between a chewing insect and a sucking insect. They have different types of mouth parts. Chewing insects are going to cause different types of damage than those that, that might be sucking on the sap and juices of plants. By and large, chewing insects are taking chunks of the tissue out of the plant, whereas your sucking insects are causing some deformities, some wilting um, damage that looks similar to that. Let's look really quickly at a grasshopper's chewing mouth parts. So this is a grasshopper you're looking at him face on. And what you'll notice is something that kind of looks like a mustache, right? That's akin to our upper lip. Now someone's messing with his teeth and you can see those black teeth, those mandibles moving side to side. So insects chew and chomp sideways as opposed to us chewing up and down. You can not see that they have kind of a lower lip that protects the teeth down there. And then they have these little fingers or palps that help them kind of taste and uh, might have some functionality for moving food into the mouth. So the bigger the bug, the bigger the head, the bigger the hole it's going to make because the bigger its mouth parts are. So by, by looking at this guy, you can see that he's going to take fresh pieces of tissue out of the plant. They can be a little easier to control sometimes because they're consuming the plant tissue as opposed to um, just walking across the plant. So hopefully, if they're touching the plant a whole lot, rubbing their body against it like many of the chewers do, and then consuming pieces of the plant, they should be a little bit easier to manage with products that leave some sort of a residual on the plant. So the typical chewing insects that we see in our landscape, while there are many insects that have chewing mouth parts, by and large, you're looking at grasshoppers, beetles, caterpillars, and then sometimes pill bugs and millipedes. Let's look really quickly though before we get into those guys um, and look at some insects that have sucking mouth parts. So this is a green stink bug on its back. You're looking at it from the belly side. You can see the eye that just went out of zoom, the antenna, and now you're looking at its mouth part. So it's just a long straw. Imagine that you don't have teeth anymore. Your teeth have now been modified into a, a straw. So if you remember, the grasshopper had those black mouth parts that moved. Well, these have just been modified into a long tube for this stink bug. And what we remember back on the grasshopper as being the upper lip that we could see, the lower lip that we could not, that's now been modified into kind of a sheath to protect that black part of the mouth. So this little mouth part, this one little tiny tooth, is all that enters the plant tissue. And it's very soft. Um, not pretty flexible, not really able to get into hard tissue like ours, but it goes into plant tissue and it sucks all the juices out of the plant. So their damage is not going to be holes in the plant because they are sucking the juices out, piercing with just one little tiny pierce. They also barely touch with the tip of their toes and the tip of their mouth of their uh, mouth part. So they're not spending a ton of time on the plant to be exposed to a lot of those residuals. Piercing and sucking damage typically um, it looks like wilting or deformed leaves, maybe a little bit of deadening of the leaves that will crumble out, but you don't have the fresh tissue holes in the plant like you do with your chewers. Aphids and whiteflies and mealybugs and scales, true bugs, these all fall in the category of having piercing and sucking mouth parts. By and large, they're generally small insects that don't move very much from the plant. So that allows them to be a little bit easier to manage. But the bad thing is that usually the smaller the bug, the faster it reproduces. So these guys are able to explode and take over uh, a plant and kill it before you even realize it's having any, a hard time at all. Grasshoppers can be a very irritating insect to try to control. They're generalist feeders. They really will just feed on anything. They really like um, peach trees and fruit trees. So if you have those around, then you know that you're always going to deal with grasshoppers. When there are giant outbreaks of these guys, they just basically feed on anything that's green. Um, if you live nearby a field, these guys tend to cultivate higher populations. So more um, pasture land is going to have more grasshoppers than even something with a lot of native grasses um, or next to just right next to a neighbor. 
they tend to lay their eggs in the soil and they will emerge in the spring and start to feed until it gets a little bit too cold. So some species might have one generation a year, but others will have multiple generations a year. And so because they're emerging in the spring young and hungry through the summer, we generally see that they're a problem around summertime. There are products that you can use as a foliar spray on plants that will help prevent them from, not prevent them from feeding on them, but kill them as they do feed on them. And those would be carbaryl and cyfluthrin, permethrin, acephate, those active ingredients. There are, um, there is a bait called nolobate and it is really slow acting. It can be effective against grasshoppers, but it is better if you have a field right next to you, a pasture land, and you know when those young grasshoppers are emerging. And so for that reason, it's really not ideal for the home garden or landscape. There are other options you can use where you'll get better results. The nolo baits often in those situations don't yield good results for us. Isopods, which are our roly polies and our pill bugs, um, and the millipedes are chewing insects that will thrive in moisture. So David spoke about some of those tropical plants that tend to be really susceptible to these guys. They occur when you have intensive moisture, you have a plant that's very, very bushy and close to the ground, and so it harbors this kind of humidity, or when you have overcrowded plant situations. Things are just crammed too close together, and unfortunately, humidity is allowed to go crazy, and so they just thrive in those really wet, moist, humid situations. To control these, try to cut back on the plants, try to trim them up. So they are off of the ground. The leaves are off of the ground. Protect those young transplants if you can. Um, cut back on the mulching a little bit. Allow things to dry out for a little bit of time and then start watering again. But if we decrease the watering, that usually helps control these guys. Beetles are a type of um, leaf feeding insect that can just do a number on certain plants, make tons and tons of tiny little holes in these plants. And in the hot times of the summer, they tend to come out when it's very cool like in the evening and so you don't notice the damage until the morning time. So if it's a potted plant or a plant that's not blooming and doesn't need a pollinator to come into it, some of our ornamentals don't necessarily need that, our veggies do, but maybe not our ornamentals, cover those plants. Cover them up um, with row covers, move them away from the area where the beetles tend to be thriving, Wait them out. For established plants, sometimes you can um, wait out the beetles. They'll cause some damage, but ultimately the plant will be fine. Young transplants, you might have to pull them up and start all over again. If they're very, very young and tender, then these guys can take them down to nubbins and they're just never going to re rebound enough. Carbaryl, neem, and permethrin are three good active ingredients to look for at your local nursery or your box stores to try to control them. Um, they're very mobile, though, so just understand that this makes them very manageable, um, very, very hard to manage. I'm sorry, very, pretty much unmanageable. So oftentimes, you just kind of have to wait them out, cover up the plants, make sure they're not on them, wait until that plant can kind of rebound. Oftentimes, they're not going to be around all season. They're just going to be around for a short period of time. Caterpillars in the landscape can be an issue or they can be a beautiful thing. So here we've got two caterpillars that are hosts uh, or utilize these two plants as hosts. And we might want to keep these caterpillars around because they're going to turn into a gulf fritillary, um, probably on that bottom one, or one of the milkweed um, caterpillars like a queen's or a butterfly on the top picture. But there are some caterpillars, and usually they're not very pretty to look at, that can cause quite a bit of damage. Those are usually ugly caterpillars, as I mentioned. Um, if it's not very pretty, it probably won't turn into a very pretty adult. Here are just a few pictures of some of those caterpillars. This one is an army worm. This is a bunch of different types of sphinx moths. And sphinx moths will turn into one of the, or I'm sorry, horn worms will turn into one of the sphinx moths down at the very bottom. And there are uh, tomato horn worms, which are specific to tomato plants, but there are other horn worms that will go after other plants. So you might find them all over the place, not necessarily meaning they're gonna go onto your tomatoes. But they are big and they eat a lot, and so they take the plants down to pretty much nothing in a matter of time. Also, when the woolly bear populations are really high, they'll feed on a number of things. I have them feeding on my Greg's Blue Mist right now. Every day I go outside and I have to pull one off of that. So if you want to try to control these caterpillars that you can't handpick off if they're too numerous, BT and Spinosad are very, very good options, and they're also 
organic. Generally, um, if it is a big, healthy, established plant, the, no, the, the damage is not necessarily noticeable. And so you can kind of, it can kind of um, overcome that damage. It's not really aesthetically pleasing if you get up close, but from a distance, maybe that plant is just fine. So consider that if you're not one that likes to put out pesticides, usually you can hand pick a lot of these guys off though. So that's it for most of the chewing insects. Now let's look into some of the insects that cause some of that sucking damage on your plants. And you can really see from this picture, that mouth part, that long mouth part that's penetrating that plant tissue and can transmit viruses, causes wilting, just kind of makes the plant not feel very good. Aphids, we mentioned aphids on every single presentation it seems like I have done because aphids are so cosmopolitan on what type of plants they want to feed on. Aphids really like plants that are overcrowded. They like it when there's poor air circulation and they like it when you overwater. So if you have a problem with aphids, consider that maybe one of those three, if not all three of those things are occurring and see if you can solve that problem on your own. And that might make the aphid population go down. If the population doesn't go down, um, it's another thing to consider is that the plant is at the end of its season. These guys come in because the plant cannot put out any toxins or any kind of defense. And so they take care of They take over a good situation. Control of aphids is pretty simple. They're very easy to kill. But the problem is, as I mentioned before, is that when you knock the aphids down, sometimes they'll ramp up reproduction, those few that were left behind. And so you end up with almost a worse situation if you don't get on a regimen and treat. But oils and insecticidal soaps and basically anything that is labeled for that plant will kill the aphids. You have to treat two, maybe even three times. Heavy blasts of water can also be effective if the plant can tolerate it because you're breaking those aphids into a bajillion pieces, but you want to do that as often as you can and for as many consecutive days as you possibly can. Remember, get on a regular basis treatment to control the aphids if they're at a point where you have to absolutely manage them. Most plants can tolerate a ton of aphids without seeing much damage, and most um, plants have a lot of natural enemies that are coming in to control the aphids for you. White flies are very similar to aphids in that they're small and so they're able to reproduce very quickly and very fast. And before you know it, you have tons of them all over the plant. Be very diligent with these guys. If you have heavily infested leaves, especially if, if their immatures are on that, those leaves, they can't fly. So you can cut them and destroy them. Don't cut them and throw them on the ground. Cut them and take them as far away as, far away as you possibly can. Put them in the trash can. Totally destroy them. Um, use a uh, daily blast of water to help try to keep that population low. Reflective mulch is something they don't tend to like. So if you have the ability and the plant is shorter and closer to the ground to use a reflective mulch that might discourage them from being around. Monitor for them too. If white flies are an issue for you, put out yellow sticky traps and monitor for them. You can find these online. You can probably find these at the nursery but they're attracted to it, they stick to it, and then it gives you an idea of when the population is on the uptick so that you can knock it back down with some sort of a treatment. Soaps and oils work well against them. Make sure that you actually hit them, that they're on the plant and you touch them with it. Neem oil also can be very effective. And if you think they're flying away and coming back or you have a really bad problem with them and you wanna go for the big guns, products that have acephate as an active ingredient would be probably a quicker solution faster solution, but it is not an organic solution if that is your concern. Thrips are an issue on a number of ornamental plants, but they also pretty much feed on anything that produces pollen. Their main hosts usually are roses, other flowering plants like hibiscus, and so what you'll see is some deformed tissue growth. They can transmit some viruses. On a lot of the flowering plants, the blooms will come out looking like it almost got burned. Um, and so they, they are a, a problem in that case. They love to hang out on weeds. So if you can control the weeds in and around your garden, if you can place your rose garden um, or other flower garden further away from the easement behind your house where you can't control the weeds or not right next to the junky neighbor, then that will help you some too. If the buds are infested, just, just cut them off and totally destroy them if you can. You'll know because they come out looking like something chomped on them or just really deformed and very, very ugly almost like if you put it in water, it would wilt right away also. 
Um, reflective mulch or foil around the base of the plant sometimes will keep them, if they fall into the ground, from wanting to get up onto the plant. Uh, spray the uh, spray and wet the leaves often so they can't really stick to them. That can be helpful. I would very much caution you against that if you're in a situation like the summertime when even water will burn your plants up. But pretty much anything will knock these guys down. Neem oil works well. If they're on the plant, you can try some horticultural oils or insecticidal soaps. But since they hide so well, you want something that has a little longer residual. Neem is one of those options. Acephate, cyfluthrin, spinosad, those can be effective. On the bloom, before it even buds out, that's when you want to apply the pesticide. And you can see from the picture there of the damage that they will do to leaves. So if you see this kind of stippled effect on your leaves with dark spots, you've got thrips. Scales are one of my least favorite insects to get an infestation of because they just tend to kill the plants so quickly before you really have time to do something about it. And because they hang on to the plant after they're even dead, you never know if you've actually killed them. So they're just, they're just a very aggravating pest. Soft scales can produce a ton of eggs, 300 or plus eggs from a single female. These tend to feed on phloem. They also um, will produce honey. And they have the ability to relocate and move even after the crawling phase. So the crawling stage is when the eggs hatch and they crawl to a spot to dock down. So we start to see leaf dieback with soft scales and a lot of sooty mold. If you don't have sooty mold, you probably have armored scales. Armored scales are not as soft, and so they tend to be harder to manage, but they don't produce as many eggs, which is good news. 100 eggs a female is still quite a bit, though. They feed um, from this individual from cell to cell. So they actually feed on the individual cell in the plant. And once they get docked down and settled, they will not move. So if you notice that they are spreading, it's not because they moved, it's because they have laid more babies and they're spreading from having more of a population. They will cause dieback and um, a death of the plant. So while soft scales may not cause death of the plant, but they cause sooty mold and other things that aesthetically are not very pleasing, Armored scales are pretty bad because they absolutely can kill an entire plant, even kind of an evergreen. The crawlers um, hatch out of their little egg case. It's their little nymph, and they will crawl to a spot where it's good to go feed. These are the easiest ones to control because they're very sensitive. They're very soft. They're exposed. So there are lots of options for scales that work very well, but timing is the key. As soon as you notice you have an infestation, try to put some sticky tape double-sided sticky tape or just wrap um, the plant with some some tape. And when you, you know, have a spot beyond where you see your infestation and if they start to spread on that, you know, just above it, once you start to see things stuck to it, now's a great time to treat because they're crawling. Check that every day. And as soon as you see the crawlers on it, now is the time to do something because you'll actually reduce the population that way. So they're very tedious and labor intensive insect to try to manage. Cottony cushion scale is one specific type of scale that has a very, very broad host range. And I just wanted to bring this one to your attention because of the way that it looks. It looks very, very weird. You may not even recognize that it's actually an insect. They can remain mobile their entire life and they will move from leaves to stems. Some scales and uh, most scales will stick to either the stem or just the leaves. And actually, they usually like the stem part. But the cottony cushion scale will, will move from leaf to stem on the same plant. Mealy bugs look a little bit different than scales. They're a little bit more mobile, uh, mobile their entire life, and sometimes they can produce a cottony or a waxy covering over their body. The male is winged, but you, you rarely ever see the males. The females have no wings, and that's what you see the picture of right there. Again, the immatures are the most, easily to most easy ones to control um, because they're not covered in wax. We believe that if you can reduce fertil fertilization, that might decrease their ability to reproduce as much. So in high nitrogen fertilizers tend to increase mealybugs. If you've got mealybugs, hold back on using the fertilizers. Hard blast of water, try to break them into pieces, do some spot treatment with alcohol wherever they're clumped up, take a cotton ball, a Q-tip or a paintbrush with alcohol, dip it, and then just kind of paint it on them. That dries them out and they die pretty quickly. Um, neem oil works well against them. Horticultural oils, insecticidal soaps. You can also use systemics where you place 
um, as you do a drench onto the soil and the, the roots of the plant take it up and as they're feeding on the plant, then they get sick and they die from it. Fortunately with mealybugs, not much will completely eliminate them. So if you have an, an issue with them on a certain plant, you're always gonna have to remain pretty vigilant, vigilant excuse me, in controlling them and watching out for them because you just, you just will always see them coming back. And what you don't wanna see is a giant population explosion. If you can keep them suppressed, you'll probably be pretty happy with your outcome of your plant. Lace bugs um, tend to do some damage that looks kind of similar to thrips as well as mites. But when you flip that leaf over, you definitely see lace bugs under there. Lace bugs tend to be more common when it gets very, very hot. There's an azalea lace bug. They also will get on lantana. Uh, many of the plants that we have in our landscape that, that really thrive and do well during the hot times of the summer, that's what they tend to be attracted to. Top part of the leaves, you'll see that stippled effect and you look underneath the leaf and you see this lacy looking bug. This is not a lacewing, which is a beneficial insect. This is a lace bug, which is harmful and a sap sucker. Again, they thrive in the heat. Their hosts are ranged from a number of different plants, ornamentals, shrubs, grasses, but a lot of flowering plants and especially those um, in the Stephanitis uh, genus. When they're present on the plant, you can apply a insecticidal soap to them. Don't spray the top of the leaves, spray underneath where you see, where you see them because it must touch them for that soap to take the waxy layer off and kill them. Same thing with horticultural oils, neem oil, you really want to touch them with it also. And most systemic pesticides will work pretty well against lace bugs. Other cultural things you can do if you prefer not to use pesticides is provide some sort of artificial shade. If it is a potted plant, move it underneath the porch. If it's not, if it's stuck in the ground, try to increase watering. What you want to do is decrease the soil temperatures, decrease the temperatures around the plant so that these guys aren't thriving, they're not producing as much offspring, and then they're not causing as much damage. Also try water blast to especially wash off those young nymphs that are pretty sensitive um, and soft. And so you can break them, you break off a leg, they're probably not gonna crawl their way back up. Woolly aphids are kind of interesting looking little insects. To me, they look like little fuzzy fairies or something. They are actually an aphid but they tend to form colonies around wounds on trees. And in Texas, this almost will always occur after some pretty significant hail damage. So you'll see all this cottony soft stuff. These are not mealybugs or scales. These are actually woolly aphids um, and they're pretty susceptible to pesticides. So you can use your oils and your soaps and that should manage them. Again, you have to spray exactly where they are. Dinotefuran, imidacloprid, pyrethrin, those are all um, other non-organic options if you need a really quick knockdown or the population is so high that these soaps and oils really aren't doing the, the job for you. Those um, non-organic options listed at the bottom are options that are good that will control all life stages, whereas the oils and the soaps might not get your eggs. Now, David talked a lot about palms, and palms are something that we love to have in the landscape if you want like a tropical paradise. We see these a lot of times around swimming pools because they tend not to drop leaves, right? And they look like they belong around some sort of a water source. On palms, um, especially on your sago palms, there is a specific type of scale that is extremely detrimental. And as much money as we spend on sago palms, and then as long and as much money as we, an effort we put into making that sago palm grow, when you get this scale, it's very, very devastating. So right now, the current recommendations based from, um, from universities, from research-based um, field trials is to, uh, first of all, if you're a homeowner, wash with vigorous sprays of water, clean off the live uh, and the dead scales as best as you can. So you, so you kind of knock the population down and then you can apply your treatment. You can, for lower um, infestations, try horticultural oils over the entire plant one time a week for up to a month. If they are heavily infested, then um, remove the, the leaves, take those fronds off, put them in a bag, get them out of there, seal it well, don't leave it back in the landscape. Try not to shake it too much so they don't fall off of it, um, but get it out of there on those really heavily infested leaves because it may not look very pretty and you might have a scraggly palm, but you're not going to have a dead leaf palm and it's not going to continue to spread to other leaves. That's going to help quite a bit. It might look ugly for a moment, but in the long run, you'll be happier that you did it. Monitor for those crawlers in the springtime. 
So treat before the population spilled. If you have sago palms, it would be a really good idea to put some sticky paper um, or sticky tape on your on your fronds, probably closer to the core. And when you see bugs on it, it's a good time to do something about it. You don't want to wait. Once you've waited until the population is pretty high, your, your poor little plant's probably a goner. Also, make sure that you know if they're dead or alive, because when you treat it and you kill the scales, it's hard to know if they're actually dead or alive. So if you scrape them and they're dry and powdery, they're dead. If you scrape them and they're gooey or they're moist, or you can almost like squeeze and, and you get, you know, wet stuff on your fingers, you can kind of pop them, then they're still alive. And then very quickly, sometimes we will see rhino beetles that will do damage in palms. This is not the coconut rhino beetle. We do not have the coconut rhino beetle in the Continental 48. We um, do not see that here. It is kind of on our radar because we have a lot of palm trees. But the rhino beetles or ox beetles that we have here are not the same species. We will see them sometimes getting into the root of the palm. And when we see that, it is because that palm has started to decay. The soil is too moist, and so you get there's you have planted them in a situation that those palms do not like to be in. You don't have good um, drainage. You're watering way too much, and so you're getting this kind of decay in the heart of that palm. And those rhino beetles are feeding from the roots, and they're going to go into it, and they just turn it kind of into like mushy. So when you see this as an issue, there's not much that you can do to return from that you planted the plant and took care of it incorrectly. And that was a result of that. So they take advantage of a good situation. They do not go into a healthy situation. They go into an unhealthy situation. So plant your palms where you should. Don't water them too much. Make sure that that soil um, uh, drains very well and it's not just sitting in moisture all the time. And you will not have an issue with these guys. Rarely does it occur, but it can occur. That concludes this weekly webinar series on some of your landscape and ornamental plant test issues. Please join us for other what weekly webinar series live and also recorded on this YouTube channel, My Extension 210. Once again, my name is Molly Keck. I am an Integrated Pest Management Program Specialist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service and a board-certified entomologist.